I want to talk today about contact tracing apps. And this was a scene in, in Wuhan um, a year and a half ago. Um, and um, you all understand everybody was leaving Wuhan. Um, they were trying to get out actually first for the New Year's holiday, which is of course what caused the spread around China. Um, but I want to talk more about the contact tracing apps and contact tracing. What we know, of course, is that the disease was spreading incredibly rapidly. The first thing we knew about it was a notice that was given to the World Health Organization office in Wuhan at the end of December, literally on the 31st of December. Uh, the disease then spread rapidly in China in January, uh, first in Wuhan and then across uh, the, the rest of uh, uh, parts of the rest of the country. Uh, and then the rest of the world in February, March, April, May, early June, as Dr. Fauci said. Um, but if we're going to talk about, and so the reason we thought about contact tracing apps is because here was a disease that spread respiratorily when people were in close contact with one another. And it was an unusual disease in the sense that it spread before people knew they were ill. Um, either some people were asymptomatic and the, uh, the percentage of asymptomatic people seems to vary greatly. Um, but uh, if we use 20% as a number, that's a, uh, a very high number. Uh, that means 20% of people who are ill um, never showed symptoms and so couldn't know that they were spreading the disease. And the disease also spreads pre-symptomatically. So for the people who do have symptoms, uh, the symptom, the, the ability to spread um, happens at least two days before the symptoms show up. Uh, so contact tracing apps were a natural thing to think about uh, because they were going to be a way to pick up the possibility of spread before people knew that they were ill. But if we're going to talk about contact tracing apps, we have to talk about contact tracing. And contact tracing is a system that the medical community has been using for hundreds of years. It was uh, crucial in stopping the spread of smallpox. Uh, before I talk to you a little about how smallpox was stopped, I wanna point out uh, a statement that came out of a National Academy study in 1993, which is that an epidemic is both a medical and social occurrence. This is something I will get back to later but it's something that we as technologists, we tend to glom right onto the science, right onto the technology and not think so much about the social side. And much of what I'm going to talk to you today about is the social side. So with, with, uh, with smallpox, uh, contact tracing was done, is done in three steps. You test somebody to see whether or not they have smallpox. You trace who it is that they've been in contact with if they have smallpox, and then you isolate all those people so that they don't spread it. But that turned out not to work so well. Um, the first thing that people tried to do with pre preventing the spread of smallpox was vaccinate. And smallpox was largely gone from North and South America and Europe by, uh, by the 1950s, but it was a problem still in Africa and Asia. Trying to vaccinate everybody in Africa and Asia was not working. And so the public health, uh, through the UN, public health tried to do tra ta test, trace, and isolate. And what they discovered instead is something that will sound a little odd to computer scientists, especially those who think about encryption policy. Uh, the technique they used is surveil and contain. And this literally is the set of words that the public health people use, surveil and contain. And it's tra test, trace, and isolate on, on, a, on steroids. You test a suspected person, whether or not they have smallpox, you trace their contacts, and you trend trace those people's contacts. So you do two layers of tracing. And the reason you do that is you're afraid that there's been spread further than, than you could stop right away. And then you do isolation. And that's how in fact, smallpox was stopped around the world. It was through doing surveil and contain because uh, vaccinating simply didn't work. But test, trace and isolate is what contact tracers do. And how they test, trace, and isolate varies with the type of disease. So with smallpox, you're looking at people who spread the disease respiratorily, actually, but they spread the disease after 
they are actually, um, there's evidence of infection. Uh, with HIV, the disease is not spread respiratorily, as I'm sure almost all of you know. It's spread through the exchange of, of, of fluids. These can be blood um, through needles shared. It can be through sexual contact. And it, it was confusing at first with HIV AIDS uh, because it was hard to understand how the disease was spreading. It was spreading through um, through heroin, uh, through communities of, of, of homosexuals, heroin addicts, Haitians, and hemophiliacs. And um, that was a lot of signal and very hard to understand. It turned out that hemophiliacs, of course, was through the spread of blood, through tainted blood in, in blood banks. Uh, Haitians, because the disease had gotten to Haiti before it had gotten to the United States. So a higher percentage of Haitians living in the United States, those who had immigrated after um, the disease had gotten to Haiti. Uh, hemophiliacs and, and um, heroin addicts, we understand now from understanding the model uh, of how the disease spreads. Contact tracing for TB uh, is different again. The disease spreads through the transmission from food or water prepared by, by somebody who already has the disease. So water in a glass from, from somebody who has the disease, water who from a, a pitcher where the person who has the disease hasn't been careful about not handling the inside of the container or handling uh, droplets on the outside. Um, in each one of these cases, the way you stop the disease, the way you do isolation varies. Isolation for for COVID is keeping somebody physically isolated. Isolation for HIV AIDS is stopping the spread through um, the sharing of fluids, through using condoms, through uh, not sharing needles. Um, for typhoid, it's not letting people who are ill with the disease prepare food uh, and, and put out meals. For Ebola, um, it share, it's through body, uh, body fluids and it's fairly complicated. Ebola is endemic. Uh, five different types of Ebola are endemic in parts of Africa. Four of them um, are uh, fatal to humans. The fifth one is not. But because it spreads through body fluids, um, even after death, uh, the people who die have to be wrapped in plastic and so on and so forth. It's very hard for those communities because there is a tradition of touching the body after death. So again, what do you want to know about contact tracing? Test, trace, and isolate isolate varies with the type of spread. When I started thinking about contact tracing apps, there were a couple of things that caused me to do so. The first is, as Carrie mentioned, is I was working on the issue of what kind of information can one determine uh, from communications metadata and communications telemetry. So I was thick in the middle of that privacy issue. Uh, the contact tracing apps were being developed and I was curious about their, their privacy. The answer about privacy is that the people who have done the exposure notification jobs have done a great job on privacy. But I wanted to study that. Um, and I was also had a personal interest because as Carrie mentioned, uh, there's a very high likelihood that I myself had COVID. Uh, I, I was ill at a time when uh, you only got tested in the United States if you'd been to China or were in close contact with someone in China. I'd been to Brussels, which didn't count. Um, but as I was doing this, uh, this work, I talked to a number of, of contact tracers. Um, the man at the bottom was a contact tracer during the period of HIV AIDS, which you can probably tell from uh, the way he dresses. Uh, the two people uh, in the upper part of the picture are contact tracers working now in, in COVID. What all of them told me was that trust was the most important aspect of contact tracing. When you call up somebody after they've been tested positive, whether it's for COVID or HIV, the first thing you do is you ask them how they're feeling. You ask them what they need. In the case of COVID, when they have to isolate, you ask them if they need uh, help getting food. You ask them whether or not they're safe isolating. Uh, I don't know how many of you are aware, but the rate of domestic abuse has gone up tremendously um, in places with COVID. And so you ask them if they're safe isolating. Uh, when I talked to contact tracers in Liberia, uh, they told me during the time of Ebola, they were working for part, these particular contact tracers were working for partners in health. 
And what Partners in Health did is provided money for neighbors to supply the people who are isolating from Ebola. Uh, that is the patient with Ebola was removed from the household, but the rest of the family had to isolate. And what Partners in Health did is provided food, provided money for food and, and water to be dropped by the house so the people would isolate. What you do first in contact tracing is create trust, develop trust. Then you talk to the person about where they've been, who they've been in contact with. Um, and, and, but without the trust, the contact tracing doesn't work. And that's a very important thing to think about as you think about the apps. So there were a number of apps developed. Um, and uh, I assume all of you being computer scientists, you largely have heard about the, uh, the efforts um, that were done. So let me just tell you very briefly. Originally, um, the first apps that came out were from Singapore. Uh, it was called Trace Together, and Trace Together worked by, um, by using a Bluetooth signal um, that, uh, so, so we have a choice of signals in, in contact tracing apps. We can use um, GPS, but GPS doesn't work very well because uh, GPS checks where people are on the outside. And as we all know, COVID spreads inside, it does not spread outside. And um, we can use Wi-Fi. And I will talk later about how Wi-Fi was used briefly at Harvard. Um, and we can use Bluetooth. And Bluetooth has the advantage uh, that the signal drops off rapidly as, um, as people are distant from one another. Uh, Singapore did trace together using Bluetooth signal. And the Bluetooth signal, um, the way it worked is if Alice and Bob both were running the Trace Together app on their phone and they were within uh, a short distance of each other for about 15 minutes, um, the apps had identifiers that were generated. The identifiers were based on the, the telephone number of the, of the, of the phone. Um, and the identifiers changed every 15 minutes because as all of you know, this is a Usenix security meeting, all of you know that you didn't wanna trace people walking through town by tracing the Bluetooth signal they were sending out. So if Alice and Bob exchange identifiers and then Bob is diagnosed with COVID, uh, what happens then is that um, Bob's, when Bob gets called by a contact tracer from the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Health asks, have you, uh, have you been exposed? Uh, have, you, have you been running the app? And if Bob says yes, then Bob's app uploads the identifiers his phone has collected. Okay, think about that. He uploads the identifiers his phone has collected. Now those identifiers, those identifiers include Alice's. Alice's identifier is based on her phone number. The, when she up, downloaded the app, the, uh, she gave her phone number to the Ministry of Health. So the Ministry of Health is able to determine that Alice was exposed and contact Alice and tell her she was exposed, discuss with her um, what she had been doing and decide and give her information about whether or not she needs to isolate. This system is called a centralized system. When it came out, um, there were other systems that came out too. Korea developed a system um, that was based on looking at uh, where people had traveled using GPS, credit card information, and um, CCTV. Why did Korea use that information? Korea used that information because um, that would tell them who had possibly been exposed along a route. If they looked at CCTV, they could see whether the person had stopped at an ATM and was there only briefly and whether other people at the machine we're all wearing masks. And they could also look at the issue of if someone was in a restaurant, then they could use the credit card information to see whether or not the people, uh, who else was in the restaurant at the same time and inform them that they had to isolate. Uh, Korea, this is South Korea, of course, Korea published um, daily, well, actually more than daily as, it, as they got the news, the routes that people who had COVID had traveled where they had stepped into, for example, if they'd been in a coffee house. Uh, originally, Korea also published the gender and age of the people who had been exposed, who had been diagnosed as ill. Uh, they later 
stopped publishing that piece of information because people were outed and that was not a pleasant situation. But as these two nations came out with these methods, cryptographers, epidemiologists, and privacy researchers in Europe, um, the United States, Australia, and several other places said, how about we do a privacy protective method? And the privacy protective method that they developed um, uh, is based on the same idea of Bluetooth exchange, but the Bluetooth exchange is somewhat different. Instead of Bob uploading the identifiers that he has uh, collected, Bob uploads his identifiers that he sent out. Now that's not a leak of privacy because the Ministry of Health, whether it's in Switzerland, Ireland, or Virginia, the Department of Health already knows that Bob has been exposed, that Bob has, has been diagnosed with COVID. So when Bob uploads those, um, those identifiers, he's not providing any new information. But what he's enabling is when Alice's phone checks in daily, several times a day, Alice downloads the identifier, the new identifiers, and her phone says, huh, there's a match. When there's a match, it tells Alice that she's been exposed. But the difference between the centralized system of Singapore and the decentralized system I just described is that the Ministry of Health, the Department of Health, never learns that Alice and Bob were in close proximity. It's a privacy protective system. So the system that was developed by the researchers and their three sets of researchers, D3PT, which was uh, a European effort, PACT-E and PACT-W, uh, which are East Coast and West Coast US efforts, except that PACT-W also included people from Australia and elsewhere. Um, all three came up with essentially the same algorithm and published essentially on the same day. I think they were one day apart. And that was the, the effort that Google and Apple then built the infrastructure for. Um, and the infrastructure, the infrastructure, what it does is it enables uh, Apple and Google uh, phones to exchange identifiers while not using too much uh, battery. Uh, and that is an engineering effort that only Google and Apple could do. And Google and Apple then said, if you're going to use our system, if you're going to use our system, then the only way you can use our system is if you are a public health department. So they developed this, they announced it in April, they had it running by June. Swiss COVID was the first app out the door built on this, um, the Irish app. Um, and, and so let me talk about each of these apps very briefly. Swiss COVID, um, as I said, is a gain-based Google Apple exposure notification system, a gain-based app. Two notable things about Switzerland, when you get an exposure notification, if you talk to public health and public health deems you should isolate, if you can't work from home, then public health will arrange for you to be paid some. That is, if you need, if, if you will not be paid by work, public health will arrange for the Swiss government to pay you. Uh, maybe not your full salary, but a substantial amount. COVID Tracker, the Irish app, uh, had a feature that was different from the other apps. When you registered, for COVID tracker, you had the option of providing your phone number. If you then uh, got received an exposure notification, COVID trackers uh, would, because the public health department vision had your phone number, you would be called by a contact tracer. Virginia was the first US state to have the apps um, and um, that was in August. Um, one of the things that Google and Apple said at the time was that the apps would have to be used to supplement contact tracing, not replace it. Um, they provided in late, uh, I think early September, something known as EN Express. EN Express is essentially a checklist. Um, how far apart should the people be? What, uh, how long an exposure before you inform them that they've been exposed? What logo do you want? And this was to enable US states to roll out apps more quickly. So GAIN solves one problem. Um, it solves the privacy problem. But the question is whether or not GAIN solves the right problem. And as all of you know, 
in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice, but in practice there is, whether you're playing baseball, swimming, or developing exposure notification apps. So prior to, run, uh, to putting out Swiss COVID, uh, there were tests on whether or not the apps were doing the Bluetooth signal properly. Here is an example of a test that the Swiss Army did uh, modeling people sitting on a train and having the phones in their pockets in their, um, and so on, and whether or not the signal was uh, between the phones was, was working. Swiss COVID came out, but researchers in, uh, in Ireland at the University of Dublin uh, tested the apps or tested a facsimile on uh, lightweight trams in Dublin. And they found that as passengers, as they sat on the tram and were not very, as they sat on the tram and they increased the distance between themselves, then uh, the signal dropped just as it should until they went to the space between the two cars. And I searched long and hard to show you a picture between the two cars of the lightweight trams. What you, as soon as I say it, of course, you'll know the point I'm going to make which is the tram cars themselves have lots of glass, which doesn't reflect signal very strongly. But the space between the trams is metal. And that reflects signal or bounces the signal back more strongly. And the signal stopped dropping as they went between the trams. That is, as they increased their distance, the signal strength did not decrease. There are other problems with signal strength. Signal strength doesn't go through walls when the walls are cement block. That's good. You want people in separate apartments not to appear to infect each other. But when signals go through uh, wooden walls, um, plaster walls, the signal, uh, in fact, um, can go through quite strongly. As, um, as I noticed one day when my um, cursor started moving on my mouse, on my screen, um, but I hadn't been using my mouse at all. And I didn't think I was subject to the same attack as the, the Ukrainian power distribution centers had in, in December 2015. So I shouted to my husband, whose study is 30 feet away from me and one floor up, uh, was he using his mouse? And he said, yes, but my cursor isn't moving. And I said, mine is. Um, that's not supposed to happen, but it did. There are other questions about does it solve the right problem? And as I mentioned earlier, uh, there are plenty of asymptomatic uh, people uh, who have had COVID, uh, estimates really vary uh, with what percentage of people are asymptomatic. Uh, but the apps, of course, uh, will not pick up an exposure notification from somebody who's asymptomatic because the asymptomatic person is unlikely to go and get tested unless you do random testing on the street or unless you do frequent testing in the office, at home, wherever it is. But if you think back to a year ago, we weren't testing people um, at all frequently. And that made the apps much less useful because of the asymptomatic uh, 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 COVID, the, inf the, the people who were asymptomatic but uh, infected. S there's also the question of exactly how do people uh, transmit the disease? So early on, we said proximity matters, but we now know a lot more about proximity than we did a year ago. Uh, there was a recent article in Science that talked about how within a home, um, the spouses have much more chance of transmitting COVID to each other than to other people in the house. The Navy ship uh, that was a carrier for people who had COVID, birthmates had a much, that is people who were sleeping in the same room had a much higher rate of transmission than other people on the boat. You wouldn't be surprised by that, but if you think about the examples for which the apps were developed, including being on a bus and so on, um, it's not clear how much of the, of the supposed transmission actually happens that way. I'd like to talk to you about other data we know about uh, contact tracing. So in Chelsea in April, 2020, a year and a half ago, it had six, Chelsea is a city just north of Boston. Uh, it's a poor city, a high immigrant population, 
And as happened in many places around the world, it had six times the state average for COVID-19 infections. A study later in the state of Massachusetts said, ah, if there is a high immigrant population, if people live in multi-generational homes, and if people are working in food services, there's going to be a much higher rate of infection and a higher rate of death. Food services, because you interact with lots of people all day and so much more chance of spread. Uh, high immigrant population, because of issues that the Trump administration had about people using public health care and getting visas and green cards in the United States, uh, lots of people who were immigrants but, um, uh, but not yet citizens were unwilling to go and get tested, were unwilling to go for public health services even when ill. Um, and that of course increases the chance of spread. And then multi-generational means there's much more chance of spread to elderly. For black Americans, um, and so, so the point about that is that the apps are going to be much less likely to be useful. For black Americans, black Americans have a historic distrust, not only of the government for such things as redlining and, and putting uh, blacks in, uh, in uh, concentrating blacks in neighborhoods that were then uh, received less public services, less parks, uh, pollution, polluting industries were often built near them. Um, there was the Tuskegee experiment in which blacks with syphilis, uh, 400 men were left untreated for 40 years in order to see uh, what the effects of lack of treatment would be. Um, black bodies were used uh, sometimes for medical experiments without uh, the people's knowledge that leads to historic distrust. And therefore less, less willingness to do certain things in poor neighborhoods using the, uh, with uh, over policing, using apps that, that are privacy protective, but are nonetheless apps that appear to be tracking you are much less likely to catch on in such neighborhoods. And then let me tell you, having told you so many negative stories, let me tell you a positive one. And this one is what public health and contact tracing did in the uh, Apache Reservation in Eastern Arizona. Um, in this particular reservation, as in many uh, rural, poor health, multi-generational homes, um, the, when they found somebody with COVID in a home, they immediately tested everybody else um, for their oxygen. Um, so the, a little oximeter, something that costs a couple of dollars, you put on somebody's finger and it tells you their oxygen level. Why do you do that? Because if somebody in the house has COVID, then quite likely other people do. And one of the things about being on the reservation is that hospital takes a while to get to. And the thing about COVID is that somebody can appear to be fine and be gasping for oxygen or close to death just a few minutes later. So getting somebody with lower oxygen numbers, not the nine, not 98%, but at 95 or lower, getting them to medical care early is crucial. The other thing that public health did is they asked the people in the home, they asked the children, who are your other grandparents? Now that sounds like a very weird question. Why do they care who the other grandparents are? Because in this culture, in this culture, kids often go and spend a week or two at a time with the, uh, their other grandmother. And so knowing where the kids have been and, and then going and interviewing those people and checking if they're healthy was a good way to prevent illness and death. And so the Native American population was doing much better than the rest of Arizona at that particular time. Um, and what that tells you is knowing how the community lives is a really important part of the contact tracing, folding that in to the questions you ask. So how does it all sum up? Well, in February, March, 2019, Trace Together and the Korean so Solutions, Centralized Solutions were launched. The European Parliament in April, 2019 said, you can only do decentralized solutions. Google and Apple announced their collaboration a month, uh, during that month and Ian, uh, the apps were launched, the uptake was not great. It's also hard to measure how effective it is. And it's hard to measure how effective it is because the apps don't provide information on what people do. Um, 
The other thing that happened is that we learned that the spread was more than 15 feet, more than six feet. So we had believed originally that the spread only happened from, um, from droplets. And then we learned that it goes through aerosols. That was from a restaurant in China where it spread 15 feet in the restaurant. Um, we also learned more about super spreader incidents as the disease happened. Um, and this is a picture of the Rose Garden ceremony. The spread almost certainly did not happen at the ceremony itself, which was outdoors, but in the indoor receptions later. One of the things about the super spreader incident is that if the apps don't collect location, they couldn't provide the epidemiologists with the information they needed to know at the beginning of the pandemic on how it was spreading and to whom it was spreading. It, so privacy was, was valued above all, but there was a cost. So how does it all sum up? Well, we have learned a bunch of things since that time. One of the things we learned is about super spreader incidents. So some of you may know about the Genentech conference in which a single incident of COVID, and we know that because it carried a particular uh, genetic uh, modification, a single incident spread to 100 cases at the meeting, a meeting like the one that we would be having today in person, except that we're online, um, a meeting like that. And it's believed to have led to, it's modeled to have led to 245,000 cases worldwide by last November. So a, case, a single case in February. Now, if those people had been running exposure notification and those people had all followed the exposure notification when it was recommended, then that would have been a lot of cases that wouldn't have happened. The other thing is the case I described, the description I gave you a few minutes ago about the business of, of spread happening within a household, much more from people who are much closer together physically. That is the, the couple who, uh, you know, the parents, the, the people who are sharing a bed. Um, so with all of that, what can I tell you? Well, the most important thing to tell you is to remind you about trust. But the other things to tell you are that how does it all sum up? Well, first of all, we have to protect user safety. So I talked to you a, a, a little bit about how the apps might say that somebody is exposed even when they're not. Um, there are different ways that this can happen. We're talking here not about whether or not somebody gets ill, but whether or not the app tells them that they have been exposed. An exposure, a notification can happen much like my husband's uh, mouse made the, the cursor on my screen move. I could have gotten an exposure notification from somebody 30 feet away and one story up if the building were made of wood walls rather than cement walls. Um, what's the point about that? Immigrant communities, low-income people often live in very crowded housing but if they're living in different apartments, they're not exposed because the air hasn't gone between the apartments. But the false positives don't protect them. The false positives cause them to have to stay home from work, something they can't afford. Second, the app should always be at a user's choice. There shouldn't be coercion. Third, the app should only ever be used for determining exposure. So Singapore originally said that it's centralized app would only be ever used for determining exposure. But some number of months later, it changed that and it shared the information with law enforcement. Now, if you think about what proximity information does, um, you who are working at um, Google, but your best friend is at Facebook and you guys get together periodically, like maybe once a week for a beer or twice a week for a beer, during a time when you're in a product launch, and you're not supposed to tell your Facebook buddy and you don't tell your Facebook buddy, but the proximity, if your boss finds out and there's a leak, you may be suspected. The journalist who's meeting with sources, proximity is dangerous. Dangerous. The human rights worker, the person who hangs out with his ex-girlfriend and doesn't really want to, you know, ran into her on the subway, doesn't want his wife to know, stops with her for a coffee, harmless thing. Proximity information is very private or should be very private. 
Um, fourth, and this is probably the most important thing, you need to evaluate the app prior to deployment and during deployment and in varied communities because it will work differently in different communities, depending on how distant the houses are from one another, depending on how easy it is for somebody to isolate, depending on all sorts of things like that. Finally, the apps should be transparent. How they work should be clear. So I wanna tell you about two different experiences. In Korea, in 2015, they had an outbreak of MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. And MERS spread across um, uh, Seoul fairly quickly. Uh, about 250 people were infected. Now, what is striking is it came from a single case. One Korean had been in the Middle East. When he came back uh, a few days later, he wasn't feeling well. He went to a hospital, wasn't diagnosed, went home. Over a period of 10 days, he went to four different hospitals, infected 29 people. They, in turn, infected another um, up to 200 people. Uh, and the spread was in the hospitals. Uh, Korea knows it's in a place, in a location, uh, where there's likely to be uh, other uh, kinds of pandemic spreading. Why? Because pandemics spread where people, dense populations live close to wildlife. And in that part of the world, in particular in China, um, that is a source for, for pandemic spread. It's a source for pandemic spread in Africa. We, we are increasingly, we as a species are increasingly living close to wildlife. And so Korea said, okay, we have to improve our game. And they did two things. The first thing they did, the two things they did, one of them was they said, in the case of a medical emergency, we're going to speed up quite a lot how we approve testing. And so although the United States and Korea had their first incident of COVID on exactly the same day, Korea was doing 10, uh, 10 times as much, maybe 100 times as much testing a month later than the US had done because they approved tests much faster. The other thing Korea did is they said, we will suspend our privacy practices, our privacy law um, in certain ways. We will allow sharing of GPS, CCTV, and um, credit card information to be able to trace spread in the case of a declaration of a health emergency. Harvard had a different approach. Harvard um, in the early 2010s had had an incident where there was a leak to the Boston paper um, about a cheating case. And uh, Harvard administration then started looking at the metadata of communications from uh, housemasters, people who uh, lived in a Harvard dorms, essentially, that acted as a, a senior leader for the students. Um, it was a, a, a quasi faculty position. And they wanted to know if any of those people had been talking to the reporter. Uh, but they didn't inform any of those people originally. That is, that wasn't part of any policy. Well, there was a great deal of shock. And Harvard rewrote or wrote its privacy policy, a very, very stringent privacy policy. So when, SAR, when COVID happened, Harvard decided to test Wi-Fi and see whether two people sitting in the same room, whether they could use the fact that they had been in the same room at the same time, because if you're using Harvard Wi-Fi, you're registered with Harvard. So they wired up um, several, uh, uh, they wired up two buildings to be able to check when people are in close proximity. They ran the experiment for a couple of months. They decided it wasn't worth it. Why wasn't it worth it? Harvard was testing people on campus three times a week. Harvard's fairly wealthy. And so it was testing people three times a week. It, what it was doing through regular contact tracing was working well enough that the effort on Wi-Fi, which had cost, I believe, something in the order of $100,000, had only turned up two cases. Um, and, and, and I'm going to put that turned up in quotes because I, I would have to go back and check. Um, they decided it wasn't worth it. The privacy cost was not worth the value. Two societies making different choices. But the point about these two stories is they thought long and hard before these choices, before, uh, before the, the pandemic hit. And having made their decisions about how they wanted to handle privacy versus contact tracing versus other kinds of surveillance, uh, they made those choices well ahead and then were able to think carefully and well.
uh, when the time came. So let me go back to what the National Academy said in 1993. An epidemic is both a medical and social occurrence. Now is the time to decide what sorts of interventions we'll make and what choices we want. As you all know, I can't tell an audience who understands this better than you guys. Um, what technology we develop, especially surveillance type technology, it's not gonna go away. So the choices we make will reverberate forever. So what are the lessons for computer scientists? Well, so the Google Apple exposure notification protects privacy sufficiently well. There's work out of uh, 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 Lausanne by Serge Vaudenay and others that comes up with cases where, where there's privacy leaks. And yes, it's correct. Um, but, and yes, I know that attacks always get better. Um, but I would put those attacks as in the noise. I would say that gain protects privacy sufficiently well. Um, but if an epidemic is both a medical and social occurrence, how does gain do there? Well, technical solutions need to take into account both the medical and social occurrences. That means the apps have to be tested prior to deployment, during deployment, and, various, and in various different communities. And I cannot emphasize this enough. I said it once before. Let me tell you an example from the UK. The UK has noticed that the uptake of the apps is higher in rural, uh, more well-off areas than in cities. What that, now, the use of the apps is beneficial. The apps have uh, studies in, in the UK because when somebody downloads an app, they give uh, part of their postal code, the part that doesn't identify them sufficiently, just the, big, the beginning part, essentially. Um, the UK shows, has, has a study that shows that the apps have prevented spread of the disease. That is, if, um, use of the apps in places where use of the apps is higher, you can see that the disease has, has spread less. And I, I can point you to the paper with statistical analysis. Spre damping spread of the disease is great. It's great for everybody. But what it also means is that when somebody gets an exposure notification, when I get an exposure notification, I'm liable to call my doctor. I'm liable to get tested. I'm able to stay at home. I can do all sorts of the right thing. But I'm moving medical resources to me. If we're going to move medical resources to me, then we also have to provide medical resources to the communities that are using the apps less. We have to provide different kinds of help there. And so what I'm saying is, if you're gonna use the apps, you wanna test deployment before, so you know what's likely to happen, but also during, and you need to keep testing it in the different communities. The other lessons are that public health decisions should govern how exposure notifications are designed. Equity should be baked into the solutions. Financial aid must be available to support test, trace, and isolate. When I talk to all of you, if you're using an exposure notification app, all of you are in a position to be able to isolate. You're not a bus driver. You're not a food service worker. You're not worried about next week's paycheck to pay last month's rent. To the extent that the apps provide false notices, that is, notices of expo uh, the notices of exposure are incorrect, they're causing people to isolate incorrectly. Um, to the extent that the apps are telling people to isolate more than they need to, that's problematic. Financial aid should be part of this. That's how, that's part of public health decisions should govern how apps are designed. And then of course, the information should be used only for public health purposes. These are the simple responses. The complex one is what I said earlier. How do the apps change delivery of public health capabilities and how should public health respond to ensure equitable responses. We have seen through this pandemic that the inequality across society was, has been exacerbated tremendously. So while I really applaud the, the privacy folks in D3PT, in PACT-E, PACT-W, for developing systems that show you can do decentralized contact tracing apps or exposure notification apps, they're really exposure notification apps, it has to be part of a whole public health solution that works to provide equitable responses. And with that, I'll stop and I'll be happy to take questions.
Fantastic. Thank you. I very much enjoyed that. And we have questions that are rolling in. Uh, as a reminder for everyone, in case you're not already there um, now, SEC 21-0812 keynote for putting in questions. And the first one comes from Jeremy Epstein. At one point, there was a report that COVID could be spread through HVAC systems. Um, she, he says, I never heard any more, so I assume it was a false alarm. Had it been correct, then proximity would have meant whatever parts of shared HVAC systems connect rooms, not necessarily adjacent, but in apartment buildings, hotels, dorms, et cetera. So using Bluetooth there would not have helped. And most likely it isn't obvious how the HVAC systems are connected, especially in older buildings uh, where there not, might not be readily accessible HVAC diagrams. So how do you do this sort of tracking where you might be connected to someone on a different floor that you've never even seen? <laughs> you can't do this kind of <laughs> Jeremy. You've set me up beautifully. Uh, you can't do this kind of tracking. Um, you know, it's the, I, I'll answer you in the way I think about my commute from my apartment into Tufts. I'll go on a bus because even though I'm on for 15 minutes, the bus door opens constantly. If it doesn't open constantly, there are not a lot of people getting on and off and I'm fine. Uh, subway, it's a different story. Um, the air is, is much tighter. Um, the, but the other part to your answer, Jeremy, is um, there seems to be, if you look at that, that study that I just described of people within a house uh, or an apartment and how it spreads um, and, and the super spreading incidents, that there seems to be almost a bimodal kind of distribution. And if that's true, uh, the HVAC is, issue is going to be less. Now, the, the hotel, not the hotel, the restaurant in Wuhan, uh, the air conditioner um, spread the, the aerosols, um, and, um, and, and, and that was how it spread. So I'm not convinced um, that, that it isn't going through HVAC, but let me point out, nobody's been in the offices. How would we know? <laughs> that, that's a very good point. Um, I'd also question. say that as far as I know, there's been a lot of work looking at that, but I, that is looking at, 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 at fixing the problem, but, but I haven't followed that piece. So I, I can't speak with knowledge there, Jeremy. Okay. Uh, next question from Dan Roche. On the point of limiting the usage of information to health purposes and engendering public trust, do you think that using private by design solutions are better options to convince the public that their information cannot be misused? Or will vulnerable groups still mistrust the explanation anyway? So there was a study in France um, in, oh, I want to say June or uh, 2020, um, but don't, don't hold me to exactly the date. They talked to, they uh, questioned French medical students who didn't trust the app because it gave away location. It didn't give away location. Uh, so these are educated people. Um, given that they're educated people, you know, medically educated people, they're not, they're not engineers. Um, but given that, I would say it's going to be hard for people to trust it. Um, I mean, if, if you live in a community where it's been over-policed or um, the government has changed the rules on you and is removing uh, last January or February, uh, 2020 is when the Trump administration put in the public health rule that if you use any uh, government services, you may not be able to get a visa or green card and so on. Um, you're going to be very nervous about doing any of that. Um, it's very different when when your income is quite assured, when it's when you're living in a comfortable situation, when you haven't been discriminated against for decades. Um, next question. Uh, so Ahmad Reza Sadeji has a, a lot, so I'm going to encourage you to go well, Actually, this. I want to fact track and, and, and say one more thing to, to the previous question. It's a story uh, that I've told a few times now. I have a, a friend my age, and uh, she was in the store with her mother uh, 15, 20 years ago. So you can guess about how old her mother was at that time. And a uh, store clerk asked for her mother's phone number, and her mother reeled off a random set of 10 digits. And when they walked out of the store, she said, mom, why'd you do that? And my friend's mother said, ever since I was in the internment camps, I never give away personal information if I don't have to. My friend's mother was Japanese American. Um, I think this stuff lasts with you for your lifetime or 
And, and, and so uh, that's how I wanted to explain my answer. Thank you. No, no problem. Thank you for, for adding that. Um, so Ahmad has, has put quite a bit actually in the, the Slack channel. I'm going to summarize it with his last sentence, which is a bit of a comment, but I invite you to comment on it. What is completely missing is a public health infrastructure that collects the required data in a privacy preserving manner. Um, so it depends on what you want to collect. It's actually extremely useful to have both proximity and location information connected to the same person. But if you have proximity and location, if you have location information, so it, you could collect location information by doing QR codes and not connecting one location with another location, and then, then it is, is safer to do. But if you connect location information with proximity information, which is how uh, you would find out about super spreading early on. And, and what you have to remember with this disease is everything we know now is really different from what we knew a year and a bit ago. Um, and um, if you think about the advice we were getting, I mean, we're getting bad advice about masks, but that's because of the unavailability of masks. It's not because it wasn't understood that masks were valuable. Um, but um, there, the, the location, every single contact tracer I talked to, every single one said, wait, the app doesn't give location information? Forget about it. I need to know that. I need to know if the person who's been exposed is in an apartment building, because I need to know how to protect people in that building. If I don't know that, what good is the app? They're looking at a different problem. Um, and they're looking at a situation where they hold the public health data within public health. But having said that, um, in the United States, various states criminalized um, an, a, an HIV positive person if they had sex with someone without first telling them that they were HIV positive. So uh, although a public health person would not share the status of an HIV patient um, in that particular case, they were forced to by law. So, so it's a very complicated answer to, to, to the point that Ahmed's making. Next question from Eric Wistrow. Was the effectiveness of exposure notifications ever measured? You mentioned measuring this to be difficult, but I don't say why it's hard to measure false positives and or false negatives. False positives, someone receives a notification but then tests negative for COVID. False negative, someone tests positive for COVID but has uh, EN installed and never gets a notification. Were this ever reported or studied, at least in sample, uh, along with a total number of exposure notifications that occurred? So what has been studied in several different places, in Switzerland, uh, there are probably more studies now, the UK study, the UK study was from October through December 2020. The Swiss study was over a longer period. There, I think there were two Swiss studies. There's a study from an island in Spain um, that looked at how much the exposure notifications cut the spread. Those are studies, I, the, the UK study I mentioned. Um, no, there has not been a study that I'm aware of that does what you're asking. So what you're asking is, um, I get an exposure notification, but I don't have COVID. Well, that doesn't tell me anything because um, in particular, uh, it seems very likely that I had COVID um, last February, March. Um, uh, I had a large set of, uh, of COVID symptoms that are really COVID symptoms and not anything else. Um, I was traveling with my husband. I sat across from Jeremy Epstein for a couple of hours during what should have been my infectious period talking. I made him sit far away because I was coughing and sneezing. And then we sat two seats away from each other at, at the meeting we were attending, he reminded me. Um, I sat on a panel with uh, people at RSA. I sat on a panel. So I was at two sets of meetings. No one I know, and I stayed with two sets of friends during that period. No one I know got sick. Um, now, I was careful about sneezing and, and so on and staying away from people because it looked like I had a bad cold. But the point is that just because you're exposed doesn't mean that you will get sick. And we don't know now medically who is, uh, we know that if you have a high rate of virus in your nasal passages, you are much more likely to expose somebody. 
but um, the app isn't going to measure that. And that the app is going to measure proximity, not the thing that actually causes exposure. And there's no easy way for the for anything to do that. I mean, we're not going to go walk around with swabs up our nose <laughs> and testing. So I've given you a long winded answer. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Um, next question from Kelvin. On centralized versus decentralized, there is a big theme in your talk around this, uh, that this is a social problem and that contact tracers first job is to say, how are you doing? Do you need help, et cetera? Decentralized does not have this human approach. So is the best approach to have both so people can choose? Um, so the, uh, the decentralized doesn't necessarily have this approach. Irish COVID gives you the option of registering with your phone number. Um, and then if you register with your phone number, when you get an exposure notification, healthcare is informed and you get called by a contact tracing tracer. That's the original version of Google, Apple exposure notification game. E exposure notification express skip that option. I think that's a real mistake. That's still decentralized, but it ropes in um, uh, the contact tracers because um, decentralized because your phone is still the one getting the information that you collected an identifier of somebody who has since tested positive, but nobody else gets that information and you don't even know who it is unless you've been out with exactly one person in the last five or seven days. Um, so it doesn't lose the privacy piece, but it enables, uh, it enables pulling in the, um, the contact tracers. Uh, so I, I was quite disturbed when, when I learned that, that Apple had not uh, included the uh, Google Apple had not included that in exposure notification. Um, while I'm on the rant about Google Apple, I'll do one more rant, which is the way they have set up the governance. Only a um, only one healthcare entity can do it in a particular location. So a state will do it. But what that means is it's very hard to do testing of apps locally prior to deployment. I mean, the state can do testing of the app locally, but a city within the state doesn't have the authorization to run an app because it's the state that's gonna do it. So we're talking here a little bit about governance. I took your question and, and took it in a slightly different way. Uh, I, I think you have the option to do that. Um, I'm going to take the opportunity to have the very last question. And um, what I'm wondering about are the, given all the lessons learned from this, the um, the privacy issues, the issues with um, the technology side, the issues with community and how and acceptance and uh, everything. What is your feeling or observation from a public health perspective on if or should we be working on it, assuming that there will be another pandemic and working on some form of contact tracing apps so that we have something available? Should this should you know hopefully COVID go away and on and should unfortunately, something else come in and take its place? It's a great question, and I'm going to both dodge it and answer it. Okay. <laughs> dodge is, I'm not a public health person. I'm a computer scientist who spent much of my career looking at surveillance technology and policy issues related to it. Um, the point is, and the, the, the D3PT, PACT-E, PACT-W, uh, did a great job of pulling in epidemiologists and pulling in I mean, there was privacy people, epidemiolo it was actually an epidemiologist who started talking to the, the, the computer scientists, but um, they pulled an epidemiologist. What they didn't do is say to public health, and of course, public health was really strapped at that point. They didn't say to public health, here is what this app does. Now, how does it affect public health? How does it change public health? And that's the conversation that has to happen. I'm not the person to answer that. I'm not a public health expert. Um, it's the public health people that that conversation needs to happen now. So that's one of the reasons I wrote the book um, is because the it describes how the technology works. It also just talks a lot about equity. I had written the book thinking I was going to talk about privacy and all the problems, but but the privacy stuff was done really well on the decentralized apps. There wasn't anything to say other than here's how this works. And yes, there are corner cases where it doesn't. Um, but the equity issue is, is not handled. And, but that's something that public health people know about and understand. So that's where the conversation has to happen. How, do, how can this technology be integrated 
what are its costs and how do you then come back in public health and do other things? Because if you cut some number of disease, of exposures and illnesses, that's great, but then you have to help the people who have had, and so that's a public health answer. Right, okay, sounds perfect. Uh, thank you very, very much. I've thoroughly enjoyed this. I'm sure everyone else has as well. Um, I can see that people are still typing in, in this, the session. So if you want to hop over onto the Slack channel and see that. But with that, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Imagine many more of me. <laughs> it's always nice to think of many more Carrie Gateses. <laughs>